Right, testing, testing. Okay, cool. I think we're good to go then. All right, everybody good? Everybody set? It's a big week. Can I get hell yeah? Yeah. Let's do it. All right, so this week, we're going to do a bunch. We're going to do Transformers today. We're going to do three parts of um, the underpinnings of ChatGPT over Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That is supervised fine tuning, the reward model, and reinforcement learning with human feedback. So over that time, I'm going to hopefully better take you guys through the process of implementing your own dumbed down version of ChatGPT. Um, we're going to go through not just the theory, but also a lot of the hands-on code and engineering behind the system. Um, it will be hard. It will be mathematical. You guys have made it here so far. And I think that already puts you in a rather elite group of people. And if you can make it through this, then you'll really be within top very few percentile of people who can do this and are aware of how this kind of stuff works. So it's really my pleasure to be able to be here and take you through that. Um, and if it does get challenging at any point, just feel free to ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. I'll stay here all night if we need to. Um, and so, yeah, all of this is, is totally free, of course. Um, I'm here just for, just for two reasons, really. One, um, because it's so interesting. And two, because I think it's a great way to give a lot of value to you guys. So hopefully this is helpful and hopefully it will help you position yourselves as people who understand the state of the art, not just some of the best people, but some of the best of the best when you can take this away and show people what you've worked on. So I hope you're as excited as I am. So I don't really think um, the week where we're going to cover ChatGPT needs too much introduction. You've all seen what it is. You've all seen what it's capable of <clears throat> generating very competently natural language or other forms of text data as well, like code in all kinds of formats. And that is what we're going to go through, all of the underpinnings of that. So today, what we're going to cover is, pull this up. Today, what we're going to cover is the T in ChatGPT. That is the T that stands for Transformers. So if you guys want to open up AI Core Portal, um, you can go to the Deep Learning for NLP pathway, and there's a notebook in there, which is the Intro to Transformers. Um, for anybody who doesn't have access to this, um, this is the link. It did, work. It, did work. It, it did work. You've got it. Does anybody not have access to the notebook or the portal? They need help with yourself. Yeah. Okay, cool. You guys at the back. Um, you've submitted. You've, you've signed up to the portal. Okay. Oh, the open notebook doesn't link. Link doesn't work. This is a known issue. Just zoom out. It's because one component is covering the other. So if you do command minus or control minus, your screen will zoom out slightly and then it should be uncovered. So that's my fault, not yours. Um, thank you for making me uh, explain that to everybody. How embarrassing. Um, but you should have access to this. So, um, yeah, so pull that up. Just give me a second. All right, so today, yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to learn about the purpose of the different key parts of a very interesting AI model called the transformer and understand how they work at a high level 
and write some of the code for those parts <laughs> so you can kind of go full circle with that, not just the theory, but how would this actually look in Python? And this model is really interesting because it's kind of uh, one of the first in the class which seems to be able to be used for general purpose computing rather than having a specialized model for a specialized task. For example, a computer vision model which has all kinds of tips and tricks focused on that problem and make it inaccessible for other problems. The transformer seems to be able to handle different modalities and lots of different types of problems in the same way, just through the, the different blocks, which you can see here. Can take in images, can take in text, um, certainly uh, better, at, better at some than others. And this is the model that's behind the chat GPT and the, all the GPTs really, because this is the T in transformers. So as you are probably aware, it's very good at working with text data. Um, and that's really where it's shining at the moment. There are other, there are some limitations with other modalities, but it can work for them, which is really exciting. So they are, yeah, able to, uh, not only process different modalities, but another interesting thing is inputs of different sizes handled easily by, by transformers. Um, so whether you have a sequence of words, which is a hundred long or 10 long, they can all go into the same model, same parameters and get processed in the same way. And, um, and what's really nice about them as well is that they're extremely efficient. They can be implemented in an extremely efficient way where lots of the computation can be parallelized, unlike we saw recurrent neural networks where for every token you want to generate, every word you want to generate, you have to do that step by step, um, and, or at least in the training phase, even when you already have the labels, you know what should go where. So transformers can overcome some of that, which we'll look at. How's the lighting? Uh, hands up if it's bad. Might dim it a little. Stay up a little what I want. Or right, I will go with that. So, so this is the transform model. Wow, there's a lot in here. There's a lot in here. And this is the diagram everybody likes to look at. This is the the now famous transformer diagram. We're going to go through each of those parts so you understand what they are. But I think firstly. This doesn't really do a good job of introducing things. And I think what's better is to look at uh, this diagram, which boils it down into, into the key components inside there. So you've really got these three different parts of the transformer. You've got this transformer encoder block over here, transformer decoder block over here. Looks like it's taking in something from the encoder. And the input to both of those is this positional encoding. So inputs and previous outputs, as we'll see shortly, they go through this positional encoding before they go through these transformer blocks. And the transformer blocks produce some output. That output might be the text. It might be um, the text which you want to generate, for example. I'm just going to check if everything's good with the stream. Sorry. That's wrong. All right. Um, and so. Yeah, once you've got those key parts broken down, um, we can dive into each of them. So transformer encoder block and decoder block, they are both a type of transformer block, and that's what I want to get into first. So in the next diagram that I've got, uh, you can see what one of those is supposed to look like. So both the transformer encoder and the transformer decoder are looking something like this. They take in a sequence of independent representations. These might be represent words, potentially a, a word embedding. And then the output you get is this contextual embedding. So a representation of all the other words in context with each other. If you have a sentence, you don't just want to look at each part of the sentence independently because they mean something in relation to all the others. And you want to be able to include that information. And so that's what the transformer does in an interesting and efficient way. So we've got that for the encoder block and for the decoder block. And at a high level, basically what you can think about the difference between those two doing is that the encoders are good at taking in everything at once. They look at it all at the same time. And then they produce contextual embeddings, which are very good because these embeddings are based on every single part of the input. And then you have the decoder transformer block, which is similar, but the uh, but the outputs are based only on the previous tokens. 
And the reason for that is because the decoders process things basically step by step. Um, and that is why the decoder part in particular is nice for language modeling. You want to generate tokens step by step. You don't want to look at things which you uh, shouldn't be able to see yet in the future. So to make that more concrete, what I'm talking about is we want to solve the problem of language modeling. I give the model a sequence and given that sequence, which is part of my training data, I want it to be able to, looking at the first word, correctly predict the next word. Given the second word, could correctly predict the third word and so on. And so when it's predicting the third word, of course, you don't want it to be able to see anything from the third word and beyond. You want all of that to be hidden. And so that's how decoders process things. It's that um, kind of, uh, that, yeah, they, they hide the context, the information available from the other inputs to reduce those, um, those outputs step by step. So this is exactly what you mean by this contextual representation? Um, exactly what I mean by this contextual representation is some combination of what the inputs represent, including information from other inputs. So if you have a, sen if you have, if you have a sentence, um, you know, the animal ate because it was hungry, the word it, of course, it has its own word embedding, but it, in that case, actually means, basically means animal. So you want to incorporate a lot of information from that animal token into the other one. And so the output that you get for that word it, it should not look like the token for it, really. It should look much more like the token for animal. And so that's what I mean by providing contextual representation for each uh, input token. And, you know, the word, uh, word tokens are the typical example. But in general, you can produce representations of things as well. These inputs could be pixels. This is a much harder problem to solve. Um, we won't talk about it today, but these could be the different pixel values of an image, RGB transparent, and you pass all of those in, and then output of the first transformer block would be the representation of that pixel in context of all of the others. How does it look, or what does it mean when it's surrounded by all of its neighboring pixels? Okay, and so from these transformer blocks, you can build a bunch of different interesting models. You can take this diagram up here, and this overall is what you'd call an encoder-decoder transformer. It has both the encoder and the decoder. Question? What was inside the transformer block? We'll get there. We'll get there in a moment, yes. I know it's exciting, but take your time. So. Is it fully connected? Is it fully connected? Um, uh, yes, there's, there's, there's lots inside there, and we'll zoom right in on that in a second and look at the exact equation step by step, number by number. Yeah, but I think, um, guys, just like as a first win, right? It's understand this. If you understand this, this is like the top view down of the transformer. That's what it looks like. It's got three things: it's got encoder, decoder, and it's got this positional encoding. So, and the next thing that's I think useful to understand is okay, what's the difference between the encoder and the decoder? Roughly, encoder can see all of the representations at once. So all of the outputs can be based on all of the inputs. And the decoders, they, um, uh, what they do is they, they only look at each token, kind of um, not including information from the future, basically, is what I'm trying to say. I feel like I need a finer way to, to introduce that. But so to come back to where we were, you've got this architecture here, which is this encoder-decoder transformer. It contains both. And these kind of models, encoder decoder transformers, they can be useful for things like uh, like translation or maybe question answering. Why is that, right? So let's bring back what we know about encoders and decoders. <laughs> encoder can build a representation of some input here, which contains all the information from that. So think about asking a question here. You give a question to your model, you want to find a useful representation of that question in numbers, which contains all of the right contextual information about the question. And so that's what a decoder can do, right? Because you've got all of this, the question in advance, you want to be able to look at every part of it. And then for every part, you want to understand what does that mean in context to all of the other parts. So that's useful to go into the decoder. You've got a very strong representation of what the, of what the input there looks like. But you want to answer that question. You have to answer that question word by word. You can't give every word prediction at the same time because the word you predict at each different output is going to depend on what the words before it were. So you need to kind of do that in sequence. And so that's where the, uh, that's where the decoders work, because when you give it the label of what the correct answer to that question was, it should make predictions in the outputs which don't include information they shouldn't have seen 
in the further on part of the sequence. So we'll look at that as we go forward. <coughs> There's a lot here as well, guys. So if anything's confusing, I could diagram it. I can um, go back or forward. So don't hesitate to ask. So, so the prediction only depends hmm? on the previous one, like previous one word, not the all the previous one. It, it will contain the context from all the all the words so far. If you're on the if you're on the second word, that will only be the first word. If you're on the fifth word, that'll be the four words. So should, should I be like previous outputs? Sorry, uh, previous yeah previous outputs yeah basically in the original diagram I think they say shifted right, which is basically you know okay. First time step, shift that right, you get first and second, and so on. Step by step like that. Yeah. Uh, good questions. Um, slightly further down, you said that mm -hmm. first users and coders only, and yep. mm -hmm. users need coders only. Yep. But during training, do you need both? Um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. So, um, so firstly, yes. So firstly, I just mentioned transformer um, encoder decoder architecture. An example of um, uh, question answering, you could use a model like T5 for that. T5 is probably the famous example you've heard of a encoder decoder transformer. Now, instead of taking both the encoder and the decoder, you can take them separately, and they will give you the backbone of the of probably much more famous models you've heard of. One being BERT. So BERT is an encoder only transformer. It's the kind of thing which runs over your search query when you search something on Google. Why would an encoder be good at that? Because you've given it the whole search query, it needs to find a strong mathematical representation of that search query, containing all rich information about the whole text. It's got the whole text in advance, so it should use every part of it to its advantage. So BERT is, that, that's the kind of thing BERT's useful, building very strong representations of input text. Useful mathematical objects, which you can then do things down the, down the line, like you know, compare that representation with a representation of a web page or some some things like that. And then um, and then the other side of that would be using just the decoder. So with just the decoder block, um, you get GPT, right? GPT is based on just a decoder transformer block. And the and the reason for that is because it's doing the task of language modeling, masked language modeling, where you have to not predict, where you have to not see all the words in the future given a target. So if we give it a big body of text and we say basically, hey, I want you to, I want you to, for each position in this text, predict the next word, of course, it shouldn't be able to see the next word or any of the future if you want it to be able to generate text. Because when it tries to generate text in the field, it won't have the future. So at a high level, um, that, should, uh, that, should, that should make sense roughly. Um, don't worry about the details yet. We'll get into those all in a second. But I think that's the next big win, right? Is like the common transform models. Encoder, decoder, example would be T5. Decoder would be GPT. Encoder would be uh, BERT. Is there a question? What is the dimension of T? Uh, well, you love the details, don't you? Um, so uh, in, in BERT, for example, 768 dimensional um, word embeddings. I think it's uh, 30,522. Different, uh, different word embeddings with that representation. It's 3,072 uh, uh, layer, uh, the width of the layer in the feed forward layer inside the transformer block. I hope that answers your question. Yes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. All right, um, question this one. Would BERT be part of the positional encoding or would it be part of the positional encoding? They both need the positional encoding. Um, we'll get to it later. So every input to transform needs this positional encoding. The reason for that, as we'll see, is that um, the uh, the attention mechanism inside transformers, the key part of the transformer block, it operates on a set of inputs, not an ordered set of inputs. So basically, you give it a bunch of word tokens, it doesn't know what position they're in. So you need to add some information to each of those tokens to positionally encode them. That's the idea. Yes. So for the um, uh, during uh, during inference, yes, but during training, you've got the whole uh, you've got the whole output sequence, and so you can give it to uh, the other diagram is more useful for this. Um, we we talk about this in more detail in a bit, but um, for the for the decoding, if you already have a target, let's say, answer to a question answering problem, you can give it the output um, the final answer here. And because it's, 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 uh, it's masked in a way that we'll look at shortly such that this output will not include any information from any of these outputs, and this output will not include any information from any of these inputs, then it can make these predictions, which can be classified per word, 
independently of looking at the other information. So you can pass it all through in, in, in one block, which is um, in, during training time, which is really efficient, really nice. Great question. Um, we'll come back to that shortly. Cool. Um, this is awesome, guys. Yeah, let's make it as interactive as possible. Any more questions, keep them coming. Uh, so yeah, some more details of the of the different different architecture there. Um, and so kind of break that down. Um, you can see there what a standalone encoder transformer would look like, standalone decoder transformer, and an encoder decoder transformer. Okay, cool. So um, I think like let's get hands on with it straight away and actually try and use some of this stuff. Um, so I'm gonna delete this. You can see it in you can see it in your notebook, but I'll code it up live so um, so you guys can see what's happening. But in here, what I want to do is I want to pull a transformer um, straight off the shelf. Uh, I can get them online. A lot of these models are available online, incredibly. And I'll try and use a GPT model, GPT two, to generate. So firstly, run that cell to pip install transformers. And then in here, I'm going to import uh, torch because I'm going to need that. I'm going to import, or in, in fact, I'm going to do from transformers, transformers, import uh, GP2, GPT2 tokenizer. That'll let me split up my input text in the same way that GPT-2 expects. The GP2, GPT-2 um, language model, GPT-2 LM head model, the language head model. So that... Uh, I need a GPT-2 tokenizer. Thank you. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to tokenize some... Uh, I'm going to get my tokenizer using the GPT-2 tokenizer dot from pre-trained. And uh, you can do this for any other kind of tokenizers as well. You just you just give it the name of the model which you want. Um, this is all from Hugging Face as well. So I think I included the docs just above here. No, I didn't. But if you want, aren't sure about this stuff, then you can just look up Hugging Face GPT-2. Um, and then you'll be able to find the full documentation for this model. Here it is. Here's how it works. Here's how many people downloaded it last month. Wow. Um, and here's the kind of, uh, here's the way that you can use this uh, straight off the shelf. This is basically what I want to do here, actually. Um, so to go back to this, yep, I get the GPT-2 tokenizer from pre-trained. Uh, I want to get the GPT-2 model from pre-trained as well. LM head model dot from pre-trained. GPT-2. Let's see if that runs firstly. It should start running and download GPT-2, which is, is a big model, by the way. So if you run this locally, um, just make sure you've got enough memory. Uh, I think it's 1.5 billion parameters in that model. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty big. <laughs> It's pretty big, and it needs all those parameters to be able to effectively model language. Um, and then, once we've got that model, we can have some uh, text, and I can say, this lecture was excellent. The one thing that could be better would be, um, that's going to be my, my input prompt. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the model to um, to... I'm going to ask the model to generate from that firstly. Before I do that, I need to turn it into the right format. Question? Are the commercial parameters in the feed forward network? Um, uh, are most of them in the feed forward part? No, probably not. They're probably in the uh, in the attention layers. Yeah, yeah. Um, you could calculate it. In fact, you could print it. That's one of the practicals we could do later if you want. Um, so basically, yeah, once I've got some text, I want to tokenize that text. So tokens equal tokenizer dot encode. You can encode that text that you've got. 
that should turn it into a list of IDs. I'd probably want to turn that into a porch tensor as well. Like that. Let's print my tokens. Should already have the model now, so it doesn't need to doesn't need to download that anymore. Um, all right, that looks nice. And then we can try and make this prediction. So we can do the model. Uh, we call the model on the tokens and see if anything comes out. We might hit an error here, I realize. No, it seems to like that. Um, okay, so there's like a big output. What is that? It's huge. It's a huge output. So uh, output is equal to that. And then the output should have some uh, some different attributes, shouldn't it? Um, let's just print the output to a shape. Run that. See what we get. Okay, so you can see what the output is here, at least the type. Causal LM output with cross attention, with cross attention's objects. That's not exactly what we want, is it? Um, can I index that? Maybe just get the first output. Take a look at that. Okay, so here's the first output. That looks more reasonable. That's a torch tensor. So what's the dot shape of that? Let's have a look. Uh, it's this big, 14 by... 5,000, uh, sorry, 50,257. What's that dimensionality? Any idea? What What are these different sizes there? The output of my GPT, to my GPT model, Alex? Is that 18 by um, So this is the output of the model. So it's not the one hot encodings of the, uh, of the <laughs> embeddings. Any any ideas? The model is predicting which words next. The fourteen comes from the fact that my guess is this is fourteen long, and the fifty thousand two hundred fifty-seven is. Any answers? Oh, I heard a lot of things. Sorry. So, uh, the responses. What what do you mean by that? What would those values be? Um, predicting what exactly? What's the 50,000 dimension? What do you think we have 50,000? I heard someone. The vocab size, probably. Yeah, right. So what this at, this output here is, is for 14 different words that came in, here's my probability distribution over the 50,257 different outputs of what word was, was probable. So this is a probability distribution where the highest number is the number corresponding to the index of the word most likely to appear next. So basically what I want to do is take the torch.argmax, that is the value in that vector, which had the largest value of the um, uh, output zero. I'll index this with a zero. I'll put this output in there. And, um, and then I've got to specify which dimension am I taking the maximum over? Which dimension is that? Is that going to be... Um, uh, I want to change the number of columns. So that's going to be a one. Um, and I think this is going to be the output IDs like that. Let's run that, see if it throws any issues. Output IDs. Let's run that. Okay, so here you can see, here's my input tokens, here's my output tokens. Um, does it make sense what I've done on that line? Or does, does anybody have any questions about that? Call out. Question? Uh, is it an instance of a sample from a probability from a, uh, conditional probability distribution? Um, or is it an actual probability distribution? It's, 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 uh, it's an instance of a, sorry, it's, it's a, it's the probabilities. So is the probability distribution over which words are connect uh, are predicting next? The whole model represents conditional probability distribution. Yeah. So basically, the whole function here, this is basically saying, um, you know, probability of outputs. 
So this is the function, your probability distribution. What's the probability of each of these outputs given these inputs? That's kind of what those numbers are in there, exactly. Um, cool, right, so now basically I've got these tokens, I just need to decode them with my tokenizer. Tokenizer.decode, my output IDs. Uh, and let's, let's see if that works. Uh, this thing is not callable. Uh, that's because I don't want the decoder. I want decode. Like that. Um, and what's going on here? Uh, so these are the these are probability these are probabilities that the model predicted for each of the different outputs. What we really care about, you see, it doesn't really make sense. These are the words it predicted for, kind of um for for each, for each part so for this it predicted is for this um for lecture it predicted will for um is it predicted a didn't really get very many of them right so definitely need some tuning but for the last one it predicted uh two makes sense makes sense that the next word is probably two would be two and so if i wanted to get my output ids um or the next predicted word i would just do my output ids indexed by the last item I guess, and then, and then basically I'd get this, uh, I'd get this prediction of the word two. And I do that on sequence to produce each prediction step by step. And then I generate a sequence through that. So, uh, if I were to put that through here, then you'd get out the, the output prediction. And that was the word two. Okay. So. That's basically how this model uh, works. I think there's, a, there's probably a cleaner example in your notebook, which you can look at of how you can do a uh, next word prediction. But that's kind of using GPT-2 straight off the shelf, right? You pull it from online, uh, you get hands on with it straight away. Um, we're going to go deeper now. So less practically useful, but more deep into the, into the insides to understand what's going on within this model. Any questions? Yeah. So, so the statistics that you for example, the first uh, prediction code, mm -hmm. the like, yeah. Uh, it's 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 everything up to that point. Yeah. So zero to three in that case. Yeah. Good clarification. Nice. Um. We'll we'll see. Sorry, I keep saying we'll see. We'll see this coming. <laughs> um. So next up, any other questions about that? That's GPT two straight off the shelf. Nice model. Big model. People worked very hard to train that. People worked really hard, and you guys can get it just like that. Easy. Um, so there it is. That's how you use it. So, um, yeah. So, so, so one thing I, I, I want to comment about is basically like the transformers, as I said, they have been able to tackle a lot of different problems and throughout all of the progress that's been made since the announcement of transformers, you can see that what's changed is not the transformer. Like for the most part, the transformer is pretty much the same architecture, um, introduced introduced initially the changes are not that uh, they're not that significant you know that same diagram i showed at the front at the top today that is the one that's basically the diagram we're using in, in, in all of the uh in all of the other models but what has changed is basically trying to format the tasks the different tasks you have in ways that can be processed by a transformer so for example um you might instead of just uh instead of just doing next word prediction which is how most of the language, uh, most of these um, transform models are pre-trained. You could take that pre-trained model and format the input as a sequence of tokens followed by a, call it a classify token. And you pass that all through the transformer and the output for that classify token, you can take as, okay, these are the predictions. Th these are the, um, the probabilities of the different things I want to classify instead of the next word. So you can fine tune it um, like that. And uh, yeah, for examples there, BERT's trained to predict blank, blank words missing from its input. GPT's trained to predict, predict the next word. T5's trained to solve um, span corruption, where you remove a bunch of tokens and just replace them with one. And so um, to kind of go a little bit more deeper with, with the code, I've just got an example here. I won't code this one up, but it's, it's really just for demonstrative purposes. You could make, a, uh, you could make your own whole transformer with a PyTorch class that looks something just like this. The key line being here, where you again just pulled off the shelf this transformer layer. So in Torch, you know, of course you've got all kind of layers we've looked at, 
um, some of the simpler ones, there's a transformer layer as well. Everything we're going to look at next is wrapped up in that layer. So if you do want to train a transformer from scratch, you can just pull out that class and specify uh, that class specifically is actually for transform decoder architectures. Sorry, uh, transform encoder decoder architectures. So you have to have some encoders and some decoders. But there's equivalently like transform decoder class, transform encoder class, and they behave, behave slightly differently, as we'll see. But that one wraps up everything nicely inside, so it's all contained. Um, so take a second to look at that example, and it'll probably give some clues as to, as to what happens next. Um, so any questions now, I can dive into them. What's the what, sorry? What is the original representation before it has this position? Um, yes, yeah, good question. So, so what is, uh, let's go back to the original diagram. So, so what is this basically? Uh, yeah, what's it's represented as, um, in the case of a language modeling as word embeddings. So, uh, so that's just a vector representation for each word that can be learned end to end in the transformer, or it could be pre-trained. Um, uh, uh, for Bert, I think it's, um, what did I say? Yeah, it's seven, six, eight for Bert, but, but like, floats or is it it's a floats. Yeah. It's like 16 or 32, but floats. Yeah. Um, so you can, you can train that from end to end, like you can see in this, uh, in this, uh, in this code here. So th this minimal transformer transform a minimal number of lines, it's got an embedding layer. And so that basically contains, uh, that's just like a lookup table, uh, for, in this case, a hundred different items, what would be their 512 dimensional representations? So it's a big matrix when you, and you give it the, um, you give it integers, uh, so you give it integers like the token IDs that we saw above these things. And each of them basically just slices out a particular row of that matrix and takes that as its embedding. It's initially random. It can be trained end to end using gradient descent um, in this in, in this transform model. Or you can get them off the shelf. Um, yeah, you can get them off the shelf like I don't know use word to vec, but I don't really think anyone does that nowadays because everybody uses the embeddings from BERT. The BERT is the good pre-trained model with the good pre-trained embeddings these days. So that's where you can get them from. Cool. Am I making sense so far? Any confusions? Right, so self-dot embedding basically asks you what you want. What, 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 what does self-dot embedding line? Um, it, so is the self-dot embedding line us doing what Bert does, but by ourselves? Yes, but it's only us doing it in, in, a, in, like a, in a very simple linear way. We're basically just, in fact, it's not even in, it's not even linear way, is it? It's, it's just saying, initially, take this index and give it a random vector. That's what I'm saying. There's like nothing intelligent going on there. Um, and then we process it through some layers, make predictions. Those predictions will probably be wrong. They have a loss. Back propagate the loss. That gives you some signal of how you should update the embeddings. The embeddings should change. Um, and that, uh, you know, that the same process will be true if we're using a recurring neural network. The same process is true, is true for training the uh, the embeddings in word to vec which is basically just optimizing a single layer neural network where the first layer is an embedding layer. But what we're going to do is we're going to take those embeddings through like a much more, um, uh, well, well, I guess a, a more complex process. But the key thing that we're going to do with the transformer is just like take advantage of lots of biases that we know um, that we know that this this data should should have essentially the way that we can think about right like, words behave certain ways or data should be allowed to represent itself in different ways. That's what we're going to do. So the embedding layer comes at the beginning of. But if it comes at the beginning of um, uh, GPT, it comes at the beginning of word to vec it comes at the beginning of an RNA. It's just basically a lookup table for your initially random embeddings. What's the loss function in such a, in such a to get to the embedding? Mm -hmm. What would be an example of loss function? Uh, so, the, so what you do is you take that embedding, process it through several layers. Those layers you make a prediction from, it's probably going to be a classification of the next word in the language modeling problem. And that's a, so classification, the loss function you use there is a cross entropy loss. So that, that's how you approach that. But again, you could train them for a regression problem. You know, I, I, I don't know what it could be. It's like, I mean, while that their example is like, you could have an, an image of an NFT, go into a transformer, you predict the price. 
and then you train on that regression head end to end in the same way. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're all thinking about text and that's, you know, what we're going to use it for. That's what we demonstrate. But I just want to highlight like these transform models, they work in the same way for any kind of wild modality of inputs, it seems. So there's no parameters in that embedding layer at all. Well, well, there's uh, there's this many. There's the product of those two. Those are the parameters. So essentially, you have this you have this big matrix. It's initially random. It's full of numbers. Those are all parameters. And what you're doing when you uh, get something from the embedding level is you're giving it an in, an, in, an integer, which is basically which row of that parameter matrix do I want? Yeah. And that's your uh, that's your vector. So they are the parameters. Sorry. Yeah, to all of those. Yeah, exactly. That's that's exactly right. So those are the parameters there, and they'll have their own um, gradient set, and that will have their uh, their weights updated as such. Nice, good question. Yes, so this is assuming, awesome. So many questions. Keep going. Yeah. Are we assuming here that our input will be hundred words? Uh, yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So that that's a fixed size um, vocabulary. That's what that is. Not fixed size input sequence length, but fixed size vocabulary. So in in Bert, that's 30,000. In GPT, it's 50,000, something like that. So is this training both the encoder and the decoder? Yes, this one would be, exactly, yeah. So here I've got this transformer layer. Like I said, it includes both encoders and decoders. I I, I haven't tried it, but I think if you set that to zero, it will give you an error because in the transfer, trans, uh, the encoder, decoder, transformer, you need the encoder to pass stuff to the decoder. So in that case, you change this transformer for like transformer decoder. I think there's a class like that. Yeah. So for any training of transformers, you would need both. No. We'll look at that. But no, you don't need both. No, for training? You, you don't need both training. No. Um, so some mistakes are taken into account by the embedding. They, they probably like yeah. like uh, uh, they, 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 yeah, so, so they may or they may just count it as an unknown token. If it's a very common misspelling, it may appear as a, as a word in your vocab. It does, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I have a feeling there's probably models on models, and there's probably like spelling correction models or and those kind of things. But a lot of that can be baked into the language, um, into the language, into the language model as well. So, um, yeah, maybe it does have representations for very common misspellings, or at least character mis misplacement common common misspellings. If we're doing the traditional right after the embedding. Yep. Why? Why would we need to have the Why would we what, sorry? If we, are we doing a position for that? Okay. Yeah. So why, why would you have to use something like that? Um, so the position encoding is not, uh, this is fixed for any, for any, uh, so the position encoding does not depend on the input value. It depends on the input position. So if I have word five in two different sequences, the word's probably going to be different. The position because all it does is encode the position. So it's not the same. Uh, the position encoding is not trained. It could be. It can be, but um, in 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 the, in the original case, it, it it's not. It's not trainable. Cool. In that in that line that's highlighted, mm -hmm. are we imagining a five hundred and twelve dimension vector being added to another five? Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see it in more detail at the end. But uh, basically, you can just think of like. I've got one vector in space, that's the original embedding, and then I add little vectors to it, which basically create positional variations of this original input, you know? Okay, this is the word when it's in position number one, this is when it's in number two, this is when it's number three, this is number four, and the model can detect those little changes and use those to understand it means it's in a different position. Cool, good questions. So, um, so you can print that out. You can print out the uh, you print out the transformer, the modules of the transformer module in the model, and you can see everything inside there. So, if you want to take a good look inside, um, uh, take a browse through that, and that's exactly what's going on in there. Take a few minutes to do that. Um, take a few minutes to look over the code that we've looked at so far, and I uh, and then and then we'll jump back into it. Yep. So, um, is this your heart of name? Is it passed with your heart of name? <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Retain 10 or remove 10? Uh, so, uh, drop, drop them, set them to zero with 10% probability. Yeah.
Why, why did they do the hilltop so many times in a row? Um, <laughs> hmm, what did I think they're probably not doing it in a row there. They're probably, um, they're probably applying it. Hmm, I'm not sure. Is this a sequential layer? I don't think this is sequential. So I think yeah. they'll probably do it after the self retention, after the multi health self, self tension, and after the uh, linear layer. It's probably not in order there. How are they working on the laser? Sorry? Uh, layer norm. So that's basically averaging over um, uh, which dimensions is this? So, so in your input, you've basically got three dimensions. You've got the um, you've got the sequence length, the bedding length, and the batch size. Layer norm averages over layer norm normalizes over the sequence length and the embedding size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th those things, because yeah, that's a, uh, yeah, and then it keeps a, it keep yeah. We won't go into details of that, but um, it, it keeps a running it keeps a running average of the mean and standard deviation, normalized about the standard deviation, so that the variance across those two things is 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 is, is normalized. So the imp so that in next input layer isn't receiving like crazy different inputs every time. They're all centered around the same thing with the same distribution. That's right. Cool. Um, yeah, I'm gonna walk around for a minute and chill. Yeah, so it's a massive change. I was changed from the 
Good to have you guys. All right. Um, all right, let's crack back on with it. Let's crack back on with it. So transformers are made up of these transformer blocks, which I've talked about. Transformer blocks look like this, takes in vectors, outputs the same number of vectors. But most of the time, it's not just one layer. It's many transform black blocks stacked end to end. And that is in the same way that neural networks are deep. This is a deep transformer. And each subsequent representation formed by the transformer block combines the context of the layer before. So in the first layer, you're building representations which combine the context of the individual tokens, the individual other words. In the next layer, you're combining representations which combine the representations of the original words and so on. And it gets deeper and deeper and the representations get more complex and more complex, more rich, and hopefully, gradually, layer by layer, solve the problem you care about, nudging the input a little bit closer to what you care about throughout this, um, uh, throughout this layer of transformations. Another question, sir? Um, no, no. We'll look inside in a sec. The Burt example, so you've got Burt large and Burt base. Burt base is 12 transform blocks stacked together. Um, Burt large is uh, 24 transform blocks stacked together. So just to give you an idea of like how deep these models are. All right, cool. Um, and so, so the next thing is basically given those outputs, those output vectors, how do you make predictions? Question? So um, can you tell activation equation? Yeah, so, so inside the transformer layer, you don't need it on the outside of the transformer because the fun thing that happens inside the transformer block is a feedforward neural network with the activation functions applied. Yeah, so there's no activation function in the attention mechanism, but that is in the feedforward layer, and uh, the transform block is basically those two things. Good question. So, um, again, we'll get to the details in a second. But firstly, just you know, send the outside of the transformer block at the moment. Um, this is the kind of thing that you might see when you actually want to make predictions. So let's say you want to solve a sentiment, uh, sentiment classification kind of problem. Then you have transformer, takes in vectors, outputs vectors on the other side. You output a bunch of vectors and you might say, you might train your model to just use the last vector upper. That's going to be where you need to contain all the information that needs to be used to make classifications. So you ignore all the others and use that one to classify. That's if you want to do something like next word prediction. You take the final output of the last transformer layer and you apply a new classification head on. 
that is just a linear layer which outputs the logits from the final representation of that transformer. Again, many of the advances have come from not by changing the transformer, but changing the way the problem is formulated, changing the, changing the objective. And so um, the way that Burt's trained, if you want to look at that, is that you're making classifications for many of the different heads where you think uh, where, where there are missing tokens. So Burt, during the training, you take away some tokens, you have the model predict which tokens should be there in that like missing value space. And on each of them, you have a classification head, which is a linear layer combining the, uh, the values in that output to make the probabilities, essentially. So that's the kind of way that you can actually use the output of transformers to um, to to put them into the into the shape of the problem which you need to solve. And so all kind of things can be formatted in that way. You might have a regression head instead of a classification head. Yeah. Okay. So, question. In the same way that for convolutional neural networks and images, people realize that higher up the network, the um, the for these dots and lines and things like that. Has there been a similar analysis on these transformers? What, mm -hmm. what, what, what you get if you go further down? Yeah, yeah. Like, what, what, like, intuitively, what do you do? Uh, intuitively, it's hard to tell. And this is, a, this is another... So, so the question was, sorry, uh, the question was, as in uh, convolutional networks where you get deep, deeper through the layers, you realize that you start to uh, activate for more and more complex high-level features. Does the same happen in transforms? Yes, it's hard to tell what exactly, and that's a very active area of research, is like understanding BERT, basically like BERTology, you might call it, um, or visualizing the insides of what the transformer is thinking layers deep. It's very hard for text, you know, because you, you only have the inputs as words and the outputs as words. All the other 24 layers in between, they're just a big vector. You can see the connections between them, we'll look at that in a sec, um, but it, it's kind of hard to tell exactly what's going on. So the loss function is going to be... Yeah, yeah. The loss function um, will hopefully encode everything throughout all those layers, but you can't optimize what's in those layers directly. Yeah, I don't know what the loss function would be there. I don't think anybody does. Cool. Um, great. So, so yeah, we've got these three different types of transformers, uh, encoder, decoder, and encoder, decoder. And you can see they all connect in some kind of different ways. So um, we're going to look inside these, but... Inside them, there's, there's just like a few key. There's a few key things, right? In there, you can see this. Um, in the encoder block, for example, you can see the multi-head attention, and that's what we're going to talk about next. <clears throat> so um, we'll start off with just single head attention. We'll look into that. Um, or maybe I'll read through this to start with. So overall, multi-head attention. What does it do? I think these steps summarize it pretty well. So if you want to kind of you, you want to memorize these, tell your friends how. Um, multi-head self-attention works, you can say this. So the inputs are linear project linearly projected to, forms, to form queries, keys, and values. We'll look at them in a second. Uh, the attention layer computes the weighting of the relevance of each part of the input has on each other based on how well the queries align with the keys. The attention layer takes a weighted average of the values, and then each head of the multi-head attention layer allows each part of the input to pay attention to different parts in different ways, computing different contextual representations for each head. And then the residual layer allows the gradient to flow back easily, even when the gradients of the parameters in the layers are small. The layer normalization stabilizes the training by making more consistent inputs to the following layer. And the feedforward layer processes the outputs of the attention mechanism and apply a non-linearity to it, which, uh, which is necessary, as we'll see. So in the first step, what happens? I said we linearly project the input vectors to form queries, keys, and values. So basically, we do something like this. We'll talk about what they, uh, well, how they're used in a second. But you want to get these three things for each of the inputs. You want to have a query, a key, and a value. So think about the inputs as words, right? So for each word, you want to know a representation of what should I look for? What should I pay attention to? That's the query. You want to know what should look for me? That's the key. And you want to know what am I? What values do I contain? Those are the values. So to do that, like I said, we just take a linear projection to get a vector for each of those things. And you do that for every single one of the inputs. Input one, two, and three, they each have queries, keys, and values, which are independent for the moment. So introducing these, qu these queries, 
keys and values introduce a load of parameters to the world. So you see a bunch of big, uh, big matrices in there. And uh, this is a trivial example where I've got eight dimensional input and five dimensional keys. In practice, you're probably working with 768 dimensional input, and probably each of these are 768 dimensional as well. So this is a huge matrix. So there's a lot of parameters in there to come back to the question earlier about where are all the parameters. Um, questions? Uh, if the input was just one word, what would be the query? Well, um, well, every every word is going to have a query, a key, and a value, and they are just some combination of the values in the embedding. That's all they are. Um, just like any other linear layer, right? Any any output of a linear layer, you might have multiple outputs for each linear layer, but each value there is just a combination of the inputs, a weighted combination. You've got weights, which are these different arcs, and they get multiplied by the input value and added to the to the node and the output value which they uh, which they point to. Um, yes, exactly. The, the dimensionality is independent, although typically I think um, it's, it's the same dimensional. But the key thing is, with this modern form of attention, is that you can have different representations of each input for what should I look for, what should look for me, and what else. So, you can imagine, like I said earlier, I gave the example of you know the animal, the animal ate because it was hungry. The word it and the word animal, like the word it should really have the representation the same as the value of animal. But it should have a query which is which is which is looking for um, which is looking for other things. It shouldn't be looking for it. I've got an example of this, so let me, let me show that. So um, to kind of visualize what that looks like, firstly, uh, here's a diagram of how the queries, keys, and values might look, and then how they're used to compute the attention score. So over here, I've got this like 3D space, imagining 3D um, qu uh, queries, keys, and values. And you can see two different examples, input one and input two. And so you can see that this query is very close to this value. So what input two should look for is very close to the value of input one. But what you're really looking for is a matchup between uh, what do I, uh, what should I look for and what should look for me. Those are the queries and the keys. So for input one and input two, you can see that um, the query for input two is not very close to what should be looked for by input one. So those things are not very well aligned. So what we're saying there is that um, when we compute the attention scores like you have over here, when you're taking the similarity between those two vectors by doing a dot product, um, that blue Q and the green K are not very similar at all. So what that means is that these representations allow what input two should look for to not align very well with what input one should be looked for by. So, any questions about that? Let me let me get some questions. Um, that's probably not clear as well. So we need to have the, uh, the dimensionality Q and K need to be the same. Yeah, that's right. Q and K need to have the same dimensionality. Correct. How often is this occurring? Uh, this is occurring. Uh, what exactly? You're projecting into the. I asked potentially to do one thing. How many times? Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's a good way. But yes, how many times is this occurring? Well, you have queries, keys, and values computed for every single one of your input tokens. Call it a word, probably a subword. Uh, well, for each of them, for each of them, once in one head, in one layer. Uh, maybe twenty-four, using but large. And how many heads? Um, uh, like eight, probably something like that. So uh, quite a lot of times. Um, so that that was this accounts for something like negation, I would say. <laughs> this was really small because it's not for that because of the previous. It, it will ignore the previous one. Mm. Yeah, it's hard to say exactly, like, to give a solid example, because it's so, like, encoded in the vectors. Yeah. So... yeah. Um, but we can look at it in a second. We'll look at the attentions in a second. So, so I just, like, this, this one thing we should be really clear about. I feel like I could do a better job of explaining it, so please prompt me the question if this, not, if this isn't clear. But essentially, just go a little more time. For every input, you've got um, a query, which says, what should I look for? 
by the time the token shall look for. You've got a key which says what sort of things should I be looked for by, and you've got a value which is like what's the information I represent. And what the queries and the keys are used to do is to see how similar these, how much attention these things should, well, how much attention the query should pay to the key. And the product of those gives you these unnormalized attention scores. So to kind of talk through a few examples here just before I ask these questions, um, you can see that the that input one pays a lot of attention to itself because its query and its key, the green at the bottom left there, they're similar. The query aligns with the key. What should I look for? And what should I be looking for by? They're very close. This one pays a lot of attention to itself. Over here, you've got you know, the, 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 the green Q and the blue K, they're like kind of aligned, not as much as the others, so some attention. Um, the, the blue query and the blue K, so this is input two, what should I look for? And what should I look for, be looked for by? They're not all similar, they're all problem. Um, and so, and so uh, that, that one pays no attention to itself. It might be, probably given no person by example, it might be like the word it, right? What does it mean? It doesn't really matter what the word it is. It really represents you know, is this the animal that ate because it was hungry or the person that walked across the road because it wanted to be so. And then some of the down here, um, bottom left quadrant, you can see that input two says, what should I be looking for? Is very poorly aligned with what input two, input one should be looked for by. As a unit negative value, um, but their similarity. Good question. Uh, I was just wondering like, how do, uh, do we choose the projection making system in the first place? Which, like, it just seems very convenient for like the query and the key to match up on the right system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're randomized initially, and we'll train the whole model, including those parameters. Um, good point. These are trainable parameters of the model. We'll train all of these with gradient descent from end to end. So, um, so what that means is to run over it um, is you pass everything through this process with random parameters. You get a final output, you make a prediction, that's kind of bad, you measure it, you measure the gradient of the, how bad it is, and then you um, do the chain rule to multiply every transformation through the model so far um, to get to the point where you end up with the gradients of the loss with respect to this and update those parameters in the direction which, recrease, which decreases that. So basically just a train using the usual backdrop? Exactly, yeah. This can all be trained um, using, using backdrop, yeah. It, and that's, that's really nice, right? It's like very complicated, but it's all trained uh, in the same way. Uh, question? No, no question. Yeah. Uh, sorry, down maybe. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, um, so, so my interpretation is the Q and the, the V are close. Yeah. So, so what, did I say, what did I say the Q and the V sound for? I said the Q is like, what should I look for? And the value is what information do I contain? Um, those two things do not interact here, um, but they'll come into play in the next step. What's the intuition there? I'm not sure. I haven't thought about it. Um, but they, but they, they're, they're not related here. In the next step, though, they are. So once you've got those attention scores, by doing QK, that can be done as a, um, as a matrix multiplication. And then normalizing it so that they have a unit variance and uh, zero mean. Then you can pass them all for a softmax, which will normalize them. So you turn those unnormalized numbers into uh, values that sum to one for each different input, and they're all positive. And that gives you basically a distribution, probability distribution, over which inputs should I pay, which other inputs should I pay attention to. So this softmax QK over DK, uh, square rooted. Um, is that's your attention weights. That's what that part is. So it's basically for every input, what portion of my 100% attention am I paying to each different input? And then for each of those different inputs, you're basically taking a weighted average of the values. So you're summing up all of the input values and averaging them by these weights. Okay? So the output of the attention, just to summarize it, is the average of the values of each input weighted by the normalized scale dot product similarity between the input queries and the keys. Question? Is the top map you have seen any normally normally distributed values of the input top? Um uh, that's what we're aiming for. 
it's not really an assumption but it's just um uh yeah that, that's what we want and that's why we divide by the dk yeah um uh sorry it's it, that's a great question my bad um dk is the dimensionality of the keys also also the dimensionality of the queries exactly cool good stuff yeah um so there's detail on why this is there um just below if you or somewhere above maybe if you want to if you want to read that but um that's the important equation that's like the most important equation in modern day ai right there that's the attention mechanism that's how it's computed um i urge you to go and check out um a lot of other resources online personally i think you'll find a lot of confusing explanations and i think that this visualization is really what you should take away from it is project the keys to get some values and query sorry project the inputs to get some values and queries how much do they align that's how much should i be paying attention to the different things you normalize that and then you use it then you take a weighted sum of the different values which are what information am i basically um, and that's the attention mechanism and it's and it's um it's not that tough when you break it down like that but i think it can be explained in a very <laughs> very complicated and strange ways so so overall, like the attention mechanism looks something like this. Uh, it's hard to see on the board, but you can see this is happening not just for one input, but for the others as well in parallel. So you start off with the input representations, you project those to get queries, keys, and values. You compute the attention in the way that I just said, dot products of the queries and the keys, and then um, take a uh, weighted sum of the values. That gives you this value here. It's the contextual value of the input. For each different input position and then you project that back into um whatever your original dimensionality was so you, you may have uh you may have small representation that um sometimes the quiz the, 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 the queries keys and values they can be different sized to your input representation so you have this final projection to project it back up maybe to into the right size and then you and then you end up with this contextual representation question Exactly. Um, yeah, sure. If the parameters were the same, um, I think what we're relying on is the model learns that it's not useful to have the same representations. And so it should learn to have different parameters for, um, uh, for the different, uh, yeah, for, sorry. What, what, what the parameter matrix for the V is the same across all the inputs. So yeah, I'm just thinking like when you multiply UK by V and mm -hmm. then say, this, this, my interpretation is like the first, the, you know, the one, one entry V is like, Um, let, let's, let's dive into this in a sec. Yeah. Um, cause I want to get, I want to get into the details and give you a, give you a useful answer. Um, but yeah, we can do all the math. Um, cool. Cause I think we're going to come to a break in a sec. Let me just get down here. So let, let me blast through this stuff. We'll get to the code and then we'll take a, take a short break and we can do that. Um, so, so this is the attention part of the transformer block. And, uh, just below you can see like what we're trying to get to, right? Uh, it's a little small there. So let me zoom in. Um, that's just good. So what we're trying to get to is basically this. So the white borders outline the transformer blocks, and you can see what we've just done there is the multi-head uh, is, or is a single head of attention. So now we know how to compute attention, and then you've got these other other few things which I just want to comment on here because I haven't dived into them very deeply after. So you've got these um these add and norm layers which are basically residual connections 
Um, I won't talk too much about them here, but they basically make it easier to learn just how the input should change instead of the whole new representation from it. And they make gradients flow back very nice and easily and normalization, which makes it stable. And then on the end of that, you've got a feed forward layer. So aside from just this thing, which I, uh, which I mentioned here, uh, well, aside from just this, there's also a, this is the input to a single layer neural network. And then that's the whole transformer after that. So you do, um, so you take the output of this, here's the residual connection, just adds the input to it. Um, and then after that, we take these inputs, pass them through a single layer neural network, which adds the nonlinearity. Because if you've noticed so far, these outputs are just weighted averages of the inputs. So if I didn't have that nonlinearity and have the neural network layer here, then each successive transformer block would just be an average of an average of an average of an average, which at the end of the day is just an average. So you want to do more than just average by having all these extra parameters, right? And so the key thing you need there is this, uh, is this nonlinearity. And so that's why this thing goes into a neural network um, where it goes through a linear layer and then a uh, activation function, and then following that, a, another linear layer and an activation function, and then out the other side. And so that basically makes up these, uh, these, whole, um, these whole transformer blocks, at least this simple one that we've seen over here. Um, so the trans uh, so the the attention layer is basically just a weighted uh, sorry that's a, so the weighting is from there to there the weighted average of these things and so it's not doing any um, it's not doing anything nonlinear it's all just like linear projections yeah mm -hmm. um, it is but this is just the weighting so you're taking um, so you're basically just taking some average of this v is a thing. So it's just like an average of the values is really what you're saying. And that part is just totally, totally linear. Yeah, so you could compute these weights in any other ways. Um, you could even have them non-normalized or something. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just like a weighted sum of this, of this V. Essentially, this, is, this could be just a linear layer, right? Where it's got some weights and the V is the input. The output is, is going to be some weighted sum of Vs. Yeah, you kind of see it then as a scale um uh that's not personally what comes to my mind <laughs> um but um but uh but if that helps you then yeah Probability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Probability. So yeah. Yeah. It's. Yeah. It's. It's just like a. You know. It's. It's a. It's a. It's a weighted. It's a weighted average. Um. You know, because you're not sampling from it, so it just has the same characteristics as some, as the probability distribution, I think. Right. Yeah. Um. But yeah, there's many ways to think about it, and I think different. Yeah. That, that, if that if that helps you, I probably don't understand it. Um. Cool. I have a question? Yeah. This is, so this is the UAV, but, uh, the, in, but it, the input doesn't feel as real. Okay, so it's not. So in the, if you're saying it's still in, in, in the input? Yeah, because, because so it's basically like imagine, imagine we computed the weights in some different way. Imagine we just said like weight the ones which are more, which, which are like bigger, for example. Um, you could compute the weights in, in, in different ways here. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just going to be a weighted average of this V, which is a linear projection of the, of the inputs. So the output is just going to be some weighted sum of this V projection of the inputs. And you vary the input, the, the weights that you use to compute this transformation vary a lot. They don't. The, 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 the weights which are... Um, that might be a key point which I'm missing, actually. Thank you. So, so, the, so the, the projection matrix for Q, K, and V is the same for all inputs. So is that, does that get trained? Yeah, that gets trained. Yeah, yeah it gets trained, but it's the same for, same for all of them. Um, but there are more than one of them. 
So we just looked at single header tension. And now I want to um, highlight the diagram of multi-head attention, which is... Uh... Okay, I can't find it. Um... So single head attention looks like that. And multi-head attention, you'd basically be doing something where you take not just one lot of QKs and Vs, but different sets of QKs and Vs. So the QKs and Vs are all parameters of this single attention layer, and they each allow you to represent what should I be looked for uh, by, what should I look for, and, um, and what do I contain in a single way. But what could be useful is that different words can, be, uh, can, can, can express those things in different ways in different situations. So, you, so what we implement instead is this multi-head attention. And that is basically where you do this a bunch of different times in parallel so that you don't just get out um, these contextual values. You get out uh, lots of different contextual values, which can be contextualized in different ways. So uh, that's what the multi-head attention does. And so the way I like to think about this is basically um, it, it also note that we'll have smaller um, we'll have we'll have smaller values when we do multi-head attention because if we have the same size contextual values, then just for every layer we add, if, if, we, if we add one more layer to make it double head attention, we've doubled the number of parameters. You don't want to add a linear number of parameters every time you add a new head. And so um, instead, what can be useful is to have instead of just one really big contextual representation, have lots of small or lots of good enough representations um, when you do multi-head attention. Uh, let me pull up that diagram in a second. Um, but, but I want to get I want to get hands on with some stuff now. So, so what I want to look at, right? So just to get a closer understanding of attention, is to run this cell. So this cell, let me walk through what it does. It imports transformers, and this time it imports Bert and the Bert model, and then it gets the tokenizer and the Bert model, and it gives a sentence, encodes that sentence, turns it into a torch tensor turns into tokens, and then passes it through the BERT model. And out the other end, I get the attentions. So here I've got the attention weights. I can get that first layer attention um, and basically get it in a nice format. And if I run that, I have to download BERT, which is a, uh, I think, 540 million parameter model, so pretty big. Um, oh no, it's 110, I think. So you get it out the other end, and we get this attention. Is that attention the right size? 12 by 9 by 9, given that my input was this. Any suggestions? How does the 12 by 9 by 9 relate to that seven word sentence? Special tokens? Sorry? Uh, it's not counting the spaces. Good suggestion, but no. Exactly. Yeah, there's a start of sequence token and an end of sequence token. So when you tokenize this, you get um, you get something else, uh, which this is the start of sequence and this is the end of sequence, 101 and 102. And then, um, and so that's the 9. That's where the 9 comes from. And so this 12 by 9 by 9, what that represents is the... Uh, what have we printed here exactly? We printed the first layer attention dot shape. So in the first layer, Bert's got these 12 different heads and they are the 12 different ways it's looking for which inputs should pay attention to others. So in the next cell, what you can do is we can run a cell to show that attention. And here you can see, at least in the first head, which attention is paying attention to which. So what we've got here is like this, this, uh, you know, this reddish value over here. It says that the word on is paying a lot of attention to itself. We've got the word here, um, Matt is paying attention to the word tired. We've got the word here, Matt is paying attention to the word cat. I don't know why exactly, um, and it can be hard to interpret. So I want you guys to take a few moments to run that cell and the one below to visualize all of the attentions in the first layer of but, and hopefully you should be able to see, discuss with people around you, 
what you think certain heads are are looking for. So let's take five minutes to do that and then we'll jump back in. Thank you. 
Um, let me let me let me uh, do an announcement and then and then we'll go. Um, okay, cool. Um, so who who likes my T-shirt? Oh, Can I get raise the hands who likes my T-shirt? Cool. Yeah. Wow. Look at all those hands. That's awesome. Um, well, I I wanted to just make an announcement, which is that you guys you're all part of a uh, a very unique uh, unique group here, and I'm really pleased to have you all all here in the room um, today. And I'm sure all of you can appreciate how much time I put into this and, um, uh, and that my time is, is rather valuable. And so I have one request, which I'd love for you guys to help me out with, which is that if you think this has been worth it, and if you like my t-shirt, then you should get your hands on um, some of this brand new AI core merch if you want to. So um, uh, two more things to mention. Um, there's only 20 of them. And second thing, I'm going to Cambridge next month. <laughs> so, um, so if you're interested in getting, uh, getting uh, uh, one of these hoodies or one of these t-shirts, um, you should definitely check out those QR codes. I'll send it on um, Discord later as well. Um, but that would mean a lot to know that we've got a good community going here, you know, because I, re I really, um, it's been a great pleasure to be spending time with all of you guys and uh, get to know all of you. And on that note, I really want to do uh, more of that. So on uh, on Thursday, yeah, on Thursday, there's a social um, after the event. So keep 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 your evening keep your evening free that night. We'll go and get a drink and hang out. I'd love to get a chance to actually like remember more people's names <laughs> um, rather than just make this like a a um, passing glance. So uh, so yeah, please come and do that. Um, other announcements uh, on the first week. We gave away a mini GPU and a T-shirt, and last week we gave away a hundred pound. And at the end of this week, um, we're going to give away something too. And um, and what I want you guys to do, if you want to get away, if you want to get your hands on some giveaway, is to pick your favorite diagram or something interesting um, from this lecture. Um, tag me and AI Core on LinkedIn and write something exciting about about today's about today's session and let all the audience know that you know you guys are not just good you guys are the best of good because you're here understanding like what's very technical content very hard to get your hands around and you should be you should be letting people know that basically for your for your future to position yourselves as i'm ai master of transformers for my subject i think that's a really unique opportunity that you guys have um, it's really exciting future coming up. So you guys should definitely make sure to make the most of that. Um, so don't hesitate to, to shout out about it. But yeah, tag me and AI call on LinkedIn. And, um, and at the end of the week, we're going to do a, we're going to do a prize. It's going to be bigger, bigger than everything before. So, um, I want to wrap up and, uh, go through a few more key things here, just in the last five minutes we have, and then we'll head off. So one is to highlight, I actually want to show you the diagram, which I spent ages making on um, the multi-head self-attention, which somehow didn't make it into the, into the, uh, into the thing. But basically, this is what multi-head self-attention looks like. I'll try and make it as big as I can. Um, but it's basically where you have not just one projection to, your, to get your queries, keys, and values, but you have many of those in parallel. So from the same input, you have different attention heads, which are projecting using different parameters to get what should I look for, what should I look, be looked for by, and what values do I contain. And that, that allows you to build different independent contextual uh, representations rather than just uh, allowing the words to have to say, I should be looked for by this thing in one way. They can do it in, in the case of Bert, how many? 12, exactly. That's what the number 12 was in the output shape of our attentions that came from the last layer. So, uh, so, you, so, so what we want to be doing is paying attention to different things in different ways over many different heads in every layer. So you can see there's like many dimensions to this model coming out. You can see how it's starting to get really big. You saw how big those trivially small weight matrices were um, earlier for the, for the QKV projections. And now you've got like many of those layers, much higher dimensionality, 
and uh, potentially many words in, in your sequence and many heads all happening at the same time. So these models start to get really big. Alex? So can uh, Yes, absolutely. Yeah, sorry. I think um, that, that should have been added in here. But the, the, the output of the heads... Um, is uh is like is smaller than the um sorry what it should be is that these things these contextual representations are stacked on top of each other to form an output representation which is then projected back into the original dimension um i'll update this diagram and and, and send that out later but basically um what you do in the code if we scroll through my attention class quickly i'll get to my uh self-attention class so this class attention, I've got these different weight matrices, the weights of Q, K, V, and the output. This is the one that projects um, uh, after we recombine, uh, after we get the, the weighted values. So in the forward method, what's happening is you take in those, que those queries, keys, values, um, which are in our, in, almost always the original input three times. So original input comes in three times. It gets projected to queries, keys, and values, vector representations of what values do I contain, um, what should I be looked look for by, etc. And then it uses those to compute the attention. So computing the attention happens like this. You can do it in a matrix format, which is really nice, just by uh, transposing the K. So uh, flip, it, flip it on its side, and you can do the whole batch, not just one example, but the whole batch of examples, or compare all of their queries with all of their keys in one single line. Then you do that normalization thing, the details are above. I know I didn't talk about it. And then you take the softmax over the last dimension. And then you weight that, weight all of the values by that in the matrix format as well. Um, and then finally project back to original dimensionality. In this case, it's the same, but um, just for the architecture, there's that other linear layer at the end. And, um, and that gets me out my attention weights in, in, in this case, so I've got 16 different examples, 16 different sentences, which are not interacting at all. They're all just processed in parallel for efficiency. They're each of sequence length 12. Maybe I've had to pad some, so they're equal length. And they each have a 300D embedding. So the output of the attention is 16 um, by 12 by 12. That's uh, That should be the attention there, right? Yeah, that's the attention weight dot shape. Um, and that is, uh, that's 16 batches going through this layer at once, and each of them have 12 tokens. So you get this 12 by 12 matrix, which is how much attention should I pay to each one? Alex? So the size of sentence the sentence Absolutely, yeah. So that's one really thing, nice thing about transformers is they can take in an, an, any sized input. What's the bad thing about transformers? Or what's the bottleneck here? Looking at this forward method, which of these lines is hardest or um, most expensive or limiting? And which one's that? This attention matrix or? This one, exactly. Why is that expensive? Yeah, exactly. So I've got to do, I've got to take as many queries as I have, which is the sentence length multiplied. I've got to square that basically. So I've got to calculate if I've got like a, a sentence of or input of T long, I've got to do a T by T, um, I've got to calculate T by T values. And each of them is like a 768 dimensional um, vector. So this thing is really expensive. And this is currently what limits transformers uh, in their raw format from being able to perform on things like video data, where you might have, um, where, where you might have billions of, of input tokens, because that billion squared is not possible on any hardware right now. So this is a um, big area of work. However, um, just to come back for a second, I think up here I point out um, some things about the efficiency. So two things that are important to notice are the complexity per layer of a self-attention layer compared to a recurrent neural network look like this. So that's that n squared that we saw there. That's the length of the sequence squared. And then the d is the dimensionality. So that's how many multiplications I need to do overall. Um, the recurrent neural networks look kind of the opposite. And they're bigger. When the dimensionality is, um, uh, sorry, when the length is bigger than the dimensionality. But in most cases, the length of the sentence is, um, is shorter than the dimensionality. 
some someone's writing a movie review it's probably not going to be 768 words long if it's a short one or like you know different tweets they're not going to be that many tokens long so for for um for, for for a lot of applications where you have these short bodies of text or where you can process them chunk by chunk self retention is very um is very much more effective than recurrent neural networks but much more importantly is that um well, there's two things which are much more important actually one is that when you have a recurrent neural network you have to process each predicted word one by one because you need the hidden representation of each one sequentially to be calculated. So if you have um, a sequence length of T, then you need to do T different forward passes before you can make prediction for the end. In a transformer, it's always constant. It's always constant with the sequence length. So of course there are more operations that need to happen inside, but regardless of the sequence length, you can, you can uh, perform the forward pass in constant time. It's independent of the time of the sequence length. Now, there are more computations, of course, because you've got to do this T by T calculation. However, all of that can be parallelized. And that is one of the really beautiful things that makes transformers exceptionally efficient. Because you can take, take each of those um, queries and keys, spread them out to different computers, and then just do that, that dot product um, in, in parallel, just one time, and then at the end. Is that like Question? one head per thing? Uh, uh, no, I'm talking about even further than that. So within each head, you've got, um, within each head, you're processing the whole sequence. Let's say it's 10, uh, 10 tokens long. Um, and I got 10 queries and 10 keys. And then I want to basically spread, take, take, take those, every possible permutation of those multiplications onto maybe not different machines, but like different CPUs or something. So you can do them in parallel, but it's nice, right? Because, because this calculation actually up here actually is possible in parallel with these things. As soon as I get these query, queries and keys, um, I, can, I, can, I can spread them out and do them in parallel. Whereas, you know, I won't go back to it, but the, the in the recurrent neural network equations, to calculate the prediction at time step t plus one, you need the, uh, you need the hidden state of time t. So you need to have done everything in sequence there. Um, so, uh, so we're getting close to the final thing I want to wrap up with, which was the multi-head attention. I just want to show you how that might be implemented here. So this is my attention head. We saw how that works. Very nice. Um, sorry, this is actually uh, slightly different, but pretty much the same. But more importantly, I've got this multi-head attention class. It includes a attribute called self.heads. And in self.heads, I create this list of torch modules. Uh, maybe I can zoom in for you guys. <coughs> um, I create this list of heads where I've got different instances of the attention head class. So I'm just creating like uh, that num heads, different heads. And then when I do the forward pass, what I do is I take the output and I apply each head to my queries, keys, and values. And at the end of that, I take the, I take the output from each of them and concatenate them. So I stack them all together. So each head outputs me a vector representation, each of the inputs, and then I take the outputs of those heads and I stack them all together. So I've got a, um, I've got a, a just one big one, well, same size as the input vector, because typically the input heads have a, uh, have a smaller size. So this head size here I'm talking about is the dimensionality of the query key values inside the head. So like I said, instead of having one big representation for the queries, keys, and values, one excellent representation of size D, it can be better to have head size, different, good enough representations. So um, that's why you can split it into multiple. That's why it can be useful to split it into multiple heads and then apply them like this. Finally, the output is projection of all of those back into the original dimension. So the output size of the transformer block is the same as the input size. So that's multi-head attention. Is there any questions about that? Concatenate. So you just get given two vectors, either stack them like that or stack them like that, depending on which dimension you're talking about. Yeah, so that's stacking all the outputs of the attention together. Um, 
uh yeah how do you get that d that that d out so so let's look into this right so i've got my attention head class here it takes in the original dimensionality and the head size and so how does that work it actually doesn't use the d i didn't use that at all so it basically takes head size and the output um the output is of size head size basically so it's as many vectors i have in my sequence each of them is head size which um let's say originally i had like uh, uh let's say i had a, a 10 dimensional um uh kqv in my attention layer if i have uh let's say i have five heads then each of the uh, queries keys and values will be two dimensional typically that's how it works it doesn't have to be that way um but it but that, that's typically how it works so what i've done down here is basically just divide the original dimensionality by the number of the heads and that's the size of the queries keys and values in the uh, original uh, of the yes of the um of the attention heads yeah just linear projection to project it back yeah exactly yeah um lots of linear projections going on i hope everybody understands about this <laughs> if not let's talk after so i'll wrap up in just a second there's only one final thing which i would um uh i'll leave you to look into mass multi-head uh mass attention later actually very quickly um you don't want to look at the future so set the attention scores to negative infinity when you take the softmax it pays zero attention to those uh to those outputs this is how you can do the um the forward pass in the decoder on a set on the whole sentence you already have without letting the model look at the future basically force it to pay zero attention to those in the future by doing this um you can implement this as such using like trio or trill um that creates a triangular upper matrix full of uh ones and uh that basically sets them those values to true and then you fill the attention scores with float infinity where that mask is true so that's the way you can implement this masked attention then when you pass things through um through uh through the attention layer it won't be able to pay attention to those things and this is the final thing in uh, this is the this penultimate thing in the complicated transformer diagram which is in the in the um uh in the in in the decoder layer we have masked multi-head attention not just multi-head attention um okay uh one more th two more things i'm going to mention one is the positional encoding so basically this is the input to an attention layer it's an unordered set of vectors there's no indication of which order they come in so basically what you want to do is add some little bit of information to stamp onto each of those vectors to indicate where it is and so in the um in the original uh paper they use this very complicated looking formula um there is a good intuition behind it but it's not really that important basically what you need to think is that every embedding token gets a positional variant like this so like i said earlier you have this original vector and you want to create variations of that vector which indicate you know the word dog at position one at position two at position three and so slight changes in the vector um and uh can be input to the model and that gives it some indication of where things appear in the original input sequence so that's the positional encoding which occurs before going through the forward layer um, there's a class implementing it there final final thing i'll wrap up um the final final thing is in decoder in, encoder um de sorry in transformers which have an encoder and a decoder the decoder has this multi-head cross attention this is where the queries and the keys come from the encoder and the values come from the uh, come from the decoder so this can be useful in the case like i said example of um question answering you encode a uh you encode a question you get a very good representation of it out of the decoder each of those representations have um queries and uh and keys um sorry queries and values i think it is i'm triply checking the notes and then the multi-head attention can basically use um can pay attention not just to parts of the input but to parts of the question so for every different time step every different uh, output it's got it can pay attention it can look at using using um uh, using the keys passed in from the uh from from the encoder it can look at different parts of the input question and use those to inform its uh, response when it produces the next character as it decodes them okay 
there's a lot there. I'm taking up a lot, a lot of time, so I'm going to wrap up now. Um, if you've got more questions, there's probably a lot. I'm happy to stay around and talk about it. And um, otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow, where what we're going to do is take Transformer, take GB2, and train it. We're going to have our own data set, and we're going to fine-tune it um, so that it behaves much more like a chatbot. All right? Are you already here? Or you gonna... uh, and tomorrow we'll be in Nelson Mandela Lecture Theatre. Yeah, in the Saeed Business School. Thanks for reminding me, man. Cool, let's wrap up. Oh, lots of questions. Steve didn't quite know like what all the layers in this 